Welcome to Remote Access. We'll begin in just a moment. Welcome to Remote Access, the current state of anti-Semitism, extremism, and advocacy with Access Paris leaders. I'm delighted to open the floor to Benjamin Ben Fredge, who will begin with opening remarks. Benjamin, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for hosting us. So I'm Benjamin Ben Fredge, a, a member of the Access Paris chapter and uh, the former Access co-chair of Chicago. Uh, for those who are joining for the first time, uh, Access is the Young Professional Division of the American Jewish Committee, um, whose mission is to combat anti-Semitism, promote Israel's place in the world, and uh, to promote democratic values. Um, this is our first International Access Paris program, and we are so thrilled to be engaging in a conversation with AJC leaders from all over the world about this critical issue affecting the French community and the French Jewish community. Uh, I want to now turn the floor over to one of our moderators for the session, Shani Ben-Walid, Associate Director of Communications uh, for AJC Paris. Thank you very much for this introduction, Benjamin. So I'm honored to moderate uh, together with my dear colleague, Dana Steiner, this very first conversation with French access leaders. This conversation is particularly timely as since the republication of Charlie Hebdo's caricatures and the start of the 2015 attacks trial, France has been faced with a series of threats. The attack in front of Charlie Hebdo's former Parisian offices on September 25, which left two journalists from the Premier Ligne Agency injured, the beheading of teacher Samuel Paty on October 16, in Conflans Saint Honorine, the attack on October 29 in the Basilica of Nice, which left three people dead. All of those attacks have shaken the French nation to its core again. This uptick in terrorism, coupled with persistent anti Semitism, has created a scenario in which France's very identity as a secularist and lighter nation is at stake. In order to discuss uh, those challenging issues in greater detail, we are pleased to welcome three or four Access Paris leaders, Marie-Sara Siberger, Antoine Agenauer, and Benjamin Benfredge. Um, and after we hear from our guests, we will take, of course, your questions. You can submit, by the way, questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, just a few words about our three speakers. Marie-Sara, Antoine, and Ben were born and raised in Paris. Marie-Sara is the Digital Communications Manager at CRIF, the representative council of the, Jew the French Jewish institutions. Antoine is a tech strategy consultant and part-time philosophy teacher at the French Military Academy. Ben is a construction project manager for wind and solar projects for a French pro power producer. He used to live in the US for a while um, and is the former Access Chicago co-chair and founder of the Young Professionals Group of the French American Chamber of Commerce. So thank you to the three of you. And Dana, you have the floor for the first question. Thank you so much, Shani. And thank you to our esteemed panelists for joining us this evening for you and this afternoon for us here in New York. Um, we really could not be more uh, thrilled and also certainly invested in this conversation. So the first question I have is uh, to Antoine. So Americans understand the concept of the separation of church and state. It's really part of the ethos of, of America, um, as it is the rule of law here in the United States. However, uh, this is a very different concept in France. Can you speak about the French concept of uh, laicité and how it plays a role in French society in your experience? Sure. Thanks. First, for having us uh, to, today, tonight, uh, indeed in Paris, and thanks, uh, Dana, for the question. Um, actually, yeah, we have the same basis, the separation of church and state, uh, to rule the politics uh, of the country in France and in the US and in most of the Western world. Uh, as you may know, uh, the slogan, let's say, of the French Republic is liberty, equality, fraternity, 
but laïcité uh, is often described as the fourth, the missing pillar uh, in, the, in that slogan. It's in the first article of our constitution, which means that it is also by law and constitutive of what we are as a nation, as a politi political society. So this similar idea uh, was born pretty much at the same moment in the 1700s, the 1800s, uh, at the moment where uh, our modern societies uh, evolved, uh, started really, uh, and have from the same idea, from the same basis, they've evolved rather differently uh, because the US is and has stayed a rather religious society and it has made it, I'd say, a positive value. Um, it was a way uh, of maintaining peace between communities, religious communities uh, in a new land. Um, whereas uh, France has a thousand year long history of uh, sharing power between um, be, uh, sharing power with uh, the Roman Catholic Church, basically. Uh, and the concept of laïcité includes the long uh, conflict for power in France between uh, the, the people responsible for politics, uh, and especially Republicans at the end of the 19th century, and the Roman Catholic Church, who used to be the lawmaker and have the charge of the education of French children. Uh, the, uh, the tipping point in 1905 was that the, uh, the actual separation of church and state uh, was put into law. Uh, and since then, it has evolved in, um, in well, a way uh, I would describe uh, as twofold. There's one, which is the principle uh, in law, the state doesn't recognize or subsidize any religion. And the second is what society has made of it and how it has evolved in today's society in France, which is very different from uh, a century ago. A century ago, 95% or so of the population were Catholic, and maybe 90%. Uh, nowadays, I think it's people who state having a religion is something like 40%. Uh, most, well, majority of them are Catholics, but there's also uh, a second uh, religion, Islam, uh, with a rather large population between five and 10 million people, um, Jews being a rather small community uh, of approximately 500,000 people. So basically, uh, what we've uh, seen uh, this concept evolve to in the past 100 years, 100 years, is that religion is a private affair. You can go to church, you can go to temple, you can go to mosque, uh, you can talk about religion in public. Uh, there's actually a quite uh, dynamic uh, debate about everything that everything religious in France. Uh, there is no discrimination in law. Uh, based uh, on religion, um, there is there is uh, the, the 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 heart of it. Uh, what seems most important to me is that um, we protect your right to be a believer and your right to be a non-believer. And I think that's what uh, French laïcité is about today. Uh, protecting your right to believe, but also to not believe. It has three main consequences. The only applicable law uh, is the one voted on by democratically elected officials. Religious law has no say in public matters. Uh, in school, your religion is put aside so that you can learn critical thinking and shared values. And finally, that everything that your personal beliefs promote and that is against the law, uh, even in private, is considered as illegal. Thank you, Antoine, for this uh, very complete answer, which reflects, I think, the complexity of the, of the issue. Let me add another question uh, dedicated to all of you this time. 
So precisely, how does this unique concept of French secularism, French laïcité, impact uh, your Jewish identity? Maybe, marie Sarah, you can answer first, and then Antoine, then Ben. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be uh, with you uh, tonight slash uh, today. Um, this question is quite difficult for me. Um, I was not raised in religion at all. My parents are secular and I, they always had uh, this value at heart and always put it first in the education they gave me. So growing up, I started to be maybe more interested in Zionism and the history of the Jewish people and not in religion itself. So I moved to Israel and it felt great to actually live in a place where life is organized according to a Jewish calendar. Uh, it was very new for me. And I liked this very strong feeling of belonging to a common history. Back in France, I kept some habits, of course, like for the holidays, for example, but I lived in the rhythm of the country, which is, of course, not the same than in Israel. Um, in France, secularism, laïcité, allows everyone to live their religion as they want within, of course, the limits of the law set by the Republic. And I, I think, you know, when you travel, when you see different countries, different kind of living, I, I always want to remember that um, in France, you can believe or you cannot believe and nobody will tell you anything. Religion is a private affair. And no one will interfere with that. If you want to be um, a, a Jewish believer and go to the synagogue and do what you want, I mean, you can. It, it's something you allow to. And I think we should uh, we should always remember and um, and welcome this fact. I personally, I don't I don't feel uh, laicity or secularism as a as a as a threat to my Jewish identity. But that's really my opinion. Um, I would say that, well, being Jewish is a big part of who I am. Uh, I define myself as a secular Jew also. Uh, I had a religious education, but not a very uh, strict or uh, orthodox one. However, um, well, I never tell people I'm Jewish until they ask me. Uh, because it just really doesn't come to mind. Uh, I'm French. And that's, that's the way it is. I mean, I don't need uh, for people to tell, to know or to, I don't desperately need for people to know that I'm Jewish. However, uh, what I would like also to say is that I believe laïcité is what allow, allows us to be French as Jews. Uh, it's what protects us. Uh, the French Revolution has set a principle uh, it was one of the first things that it actually did, give every rights to Jews as individuals and none as a group. And it's this principle that has led uh, to uh, approximately 100 years later and 200 years uh, from to, to this day, um, us to be uh, included in society, being able to, uh, well, basically go out of ghettos uh, and not feel threatened uh, by the, uh, on one side, um, the rest of society, and on the other side, the, uh, the small communities from, uh, that Europe had where Jews were basically uh, condemned to stay together. Uh, there was a saying in the late 19th century, uh, happy as a Jew in France, which, well, since then has known <laughs> a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, disappointments, but uh, it's saying something that the French Republic uh, and the principles amongst which laïcité uh, were really what freed Jews uh, here in France. And I'll finish by saying that something that's very meaningful to me is that every Friday, every uh, Shabbat day, in every synagogue in France, uh, we say a prayer for the French Republic. True. Benjamin, maybe you want to add something? Yeah. Um, thanks. So uh, I 
share both of um, uh, what Antoine and Marisara uh, shared, to get, shared uh, just a little bit ago with some nuanced. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of my background, so I'm half Sephardic and half Ashkenazi uh, from a family that uh, was granted the citizenship in 1791 in France. Uh, so a Jewish family from, uh, from Lorraine. Um, and so I was raised, in, I grew up in that thing where, you know, you don't need to say that you're Jewish, no need to tell it, um, no need to just, you know, uh, live hidden, live happy. And uh, so I always was really like the ideals, the French ideals of the, of the revolution. We, I was fueled with that and, and I was filled of that by, uh, when I grew up uh, in my family. Uh, and when I went to junior high school, uh, it's the first time that I uh, actually faced anti-Semitism. And, and I wondered, I, start, I started wondering, okay, then, you know, what's the, like, why? Why am I being a scapegoat? Because I'm, uh, because I'm Jewish. The secularity uh, should ensure that I am, uh, that I have every right as other citizens to, uh, to, you know, believe what, whatever I whatever I want. So um, when I was going to to, and I remember previously before before being in in the high school, uh, I had to lie when I was going uh, when I when I was taking off for uh, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or Pesach, I had to say okay, like I have a family issue. I have a uh, you know a funeral that I have to attend, or I had to call up sick, and uh, so that is something that I, I didn't really like about uh, about that when I when I grew up. It's something that you know I didn't really tell anybody I was Jewish. It was like it was hidden, and uh, um, and I started wondering when I was in junior high, where is the tolerance, uh, where is uh, the respect of my belief, and. And then, so it, this kept going for, you know, for a few years and I pursued my master's degree in, in Chicago. So I moved to America. And, uh, and when I got there, I was going to the synagogue for Shabbat. And, and I saw people in the street wearing their kippahs, wearing their kippahs and even their tallies on. And the first thing I, saw, I, I said to myself was, are those guys crazy? Like there might be attacks or something, you know. And I was like, I was very, uh, very curious and very. Um, first, I was scared for them, and then I, I wondered, and I was like, like why? Like how, how come that I can do that in France if I want to? Uh, how come that I don't feel secure when I get off uh, the synagogue after Yom Kippur and I have to, you know, move quickly back to my home and back to my place, not only sitting in front of the synagogue. And I, I arrived in front of the synagogue, there was not any guard. In France, uh, there, is, there has always been a, a police security or, in, or even the, mil, the, the military in front of the synagogues. I, I always worked with that. And I wondered, okay, like what's, what's the difference here? Um, something that even struck me more was that uh, when I started working in Chicago, uh, in my company, I didn't tell my coworkers I was Jewish, and uh, I can't remember how it came up. But after a few months, uh, the conversation was brought up, and I told them I was Jewish, and they were like, "Wow, really? You are Jewish? Like that's amazing! Like why? Why didn't you tell us uh, before?" And they, they told they, they they wished me a happy Passover. They were like, uh, "Oh, what are you guys doing for? What, what are you doing tonight for the seders? Are you with the?" Uh, family, like I with friends, but they were non-Jewish. Uh, they were not Jewish. So, so I I was really pleased to see that um, that people knew about all the stuff, and this made me question uh, the way we were doing it in France. The fact that uh, we have to keep it for the private space means that the fact that we have to keep religion for the private space. Uh, also creates taboos, and um, if we don't have the space to share about our background and our origins at school or in the public life, it creates frustrations and it creates uh, the scare of the other. So 
I'm, I'm kind of nuanced on, 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 on that issue because in the same time, it enables every, every, everybody to be uh, the children of the modern republic. Uh, and so we can all share a common heritage. And I mean, the, the, the common heritage is also, is also a question I want, I, I'm always facing uh, because uh, of the, the narrative uh, that, a, that, a, that a country uses to build up a nation uh, because it's hard for me to understand how someone who is first generation can share uh, the history of a nation 2000 years old. So, so that's always something I'm, 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 I'm struggling with. And the fact that we don't have the space uh, when, we are, when we are kids in school to, to share uh, and to express the, our origins and our and our backgrounds uh, is is kind of tough to take for me, and so uh, the laicite evolved over time. Uh, as uh, Antoine re reminded it a, li a little earlier, first the laicite was built on the fight on the fight against uh, the the power of the church, and Catholicism represented the monarchy, so it had to be killed back then. And so uh, Robespierre, we, who was a leader during the French Revolution, beha had to be like beheaded the king, beheaded the nobles, and beheaded the clergy. So uh, that's something very important to, to understand. So it was first built to f in, in against something, and then we moved on to um, uh, like in the in the eighties. In the 1980s, there was a massive immigration wave uh, from North Africa, and the the light city was was used to serve the integration model, meaning that uh, to integrate the massive immigration, we told them, okay, light city is very important, is very important for you guys to integrate, and so please um, leave your beliefs at home, leave your language at home leave your religion at home and mix up with everybody. But the thing is that those people never, uh, like didn't have a lot of interactions with friends, with the French culture before, beforehand. And so it created a lot of frustrations and created a lot of uh, um, anxiety of losing, of losing their, their, own, their own cultures. And so we, we also did the same thing with like French regions, for, in, for instance, in Brittany. Uh, there is like a, an, an assimilation process where Brittany, for instance, the language uh, had to be erased to be just like the good children of the Republic. And so it's good in a sense because it enables everybody to share a common heritage, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it's also, it creates frustrations and it creates some, um, some, uh, yeah, some, frust some frustrations because you have to give up your, I wouldn't say identity, but you have to be, to give up your roots to be together. And instead, I would, I would, I would, I really enjoy the, the, the American model where it's good. You can be a good American and a proud Irish. You can be a good American and a proud Italian. You can be, you can be a good American and a proud Brazilian or whatever. And so, uh, so that's like where for me, it's, it's difficult in France to, so, it, you, you can't, I mean, you can have uh, uh, two origins, but it's difficult. You, you need to to first say, okay, I'm, I'm a proud French, and then, you know, the, the background and the origin has to stay uh, kind of in the dark. And uh, that's like something that I, I struggle with since I've been back from America and after I've seen the, the, the model cross Atlantic. Um, so that's uh, that's my take on that. Well, thank you for those very interesting different answers. <laughs> so now let's move on to a more difficult issue. Um, at the time of the anti-Semitic attack in Toulouse in 2012, the Jewish population did not did not really feel supported. But one of our latest surveys published earlier this year shows that. 73% of French people consider that anti-Semitism is not the problem of Jews, but that of French society as a whole. 
So there seems to have been a change in the attitude of the population and public authorities towards the rise of Islamist extremism. Um, have you noticed such a shift? And can you describe maybe the current atmosphere in France in light of the recent attacks? Maybe Antoine and Ben? Sure. An um, there's many things that have questions, so I'll try to address them all and, uh, uh, and be somewhat brief. But uh, I feel like, to start with the end, there's a new feeling of fear uh, that is shared uh, in the immense majority of the population um, that I had personally not seen that uh, strongly before, even in 2015, uh, at the time of uh, Bataclan, uh, because there's a, I feel like there's a notion that it could happen, being killed could happen to anybody, anywhere, uh, just for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, the, um, there was uh, a sense until recently of targeting, uh, which has been kind of lost. Um, but, well, two things from there. Uh, I personally haven't felt a change in the notion that anti-Semitism was a shared issue by most of the rest of the population. Uh, historically, it's been this denial and disregard. Uh, basically, also uh, two, two, uh, two anecdotes come to mind. Uh, one in the late 70s, uh, after uh, an attack on a, on a synagogue uh, that killed, according to the French prime minister at the time, Jews and innocent people, uh, which was which still uh, angers me when I think about it. And um, the second anecdote is uh, in the early 2000s, when uh, President, Ch President Chirac uh, and Prime Minister Jospin at the time uh, denied uh, denied the notion of uh, anti-Semitism in France exist, even existing. Uh, although we were all experiencing that fear that everybody is, uh, uh, that everybody is, uh, is feeling right now. Uh, Benjamin said something earlier that I felt all my life. I have never been to a synagogue that wasn't heavily guarded by armed police uh, or the military. I have never been to a synagogue uh, without thorough control uh, of my belongings and my uh, myself, uh, even when I was a child, uh, it is a very uh, well. It is a very strange way to uh, to grow up uh, in, but I must say that right now I feel like um, I've been prepared uh, because I've always I've always kind of felt like a target uh, to some people, not France, not the institutions, not the French population, but to some people, obviously. Another anecdote uh, is that I remember a few years ago, my brother was punched in the street uh, by a, a drunk guy. My brother doesn't look Jewish at all. He doesn't look anything really. He's a, he's a handsome man but he doesn't look particularly Jewish. Um, so he was punched, he was bleeding, bleeding a lot. And this uh, vendor um, goes to him, helps him, gives him water, gives him a towel uh, and calls, the, uh, calls an ambulance for him. A few days later, it was Yom Kippur. We passed by the same vendor uh, with kippot on our heads because that's the only day of the year uh, we do it. We do. That. We did that. We don't do it anymore. The the guy actually spat on us. The same guy. Um, so it's uh, again. Uh, I'm very shook, but by, by what's happening right now. Um, but I. Uh, I feel like it has. Uh, I. I feel a very strange sense of uh, being able to share this feeling with people who are not Jewish. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very saddening. Uh, 
and it's uh, it's also uh, it doesn't erase a frustration and uh, and something that is a uh, and the well, a frustration um, we've had um, radical Islamist attacks in France uh, for at least the past 40 years in the 80s it was uh, Iran in the 90s it was linked to the civil war in Algeria uh, in the two years 2000 it was um, linked to Israel and Afghanistan and in the uh, since 2010 2012 uh, it's linked to uh, the rise uh, of ISIS basically um, there has always been uh, attacks against Jews and maybe uh, other categories, other symbols, uh, music, the Bataclan, uh, the police, uh, several times. But one steady thing has been that there has been attack on Jews on these uh, in every cycle and in almost every occurrence. And that uh, the attacks on Jews alone are never enough to provoke a reaction. And I'll finish by saying that the other day on the radio, uh, I heard a journalist uh, and an expert in something on the, the on France Info, so the uh, government-owned radio, uh, saying that uh, after Nice there was a brand new situation uh, that French people had to uh, realize. Uh, but for the first time in, uh, in centuries, uh, religious places had to be guarded by the police uh, to uh, keep people safe. And I felt, uh, I felt very frustrated with that sentence because I've been experiencing that for the past three years. Wow. I really have to say that, you know, you can read about these things here in the States or anywhere else around the world, but there's something that's incredibly raw and really, I almost want to say shocking uh, about hearing all of these stories and hearing all of these experiences. And we are just so phenomenally grateful for each of you for sharing your, your brilliance and, and, and your uh, real comprehension around this very complex topic. So I just want to say from where I'm sitting in Manhattan, this is just truly phenomenal. Um, my next question is, is uh, really for, for anyone. And it's about uh, recent statements by um, French President um, Emmanuel Macron. Um, in, there was an article that was recently published actually in the New York Times um, that uh, in which uh, President Macron uh, complained that the Anglo-American press has blamed France instead of those who have committed a spate of murderous terrorist attacks. Um, thoughts on, on this assessment, um, especially given that, you know, for, from where we are particularly sitting, there's, there's a sense, as this earlier, uh, sort of a lack of clarity about the, the difference between Dana, I think we can't hear you. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is it OK? Oh, Wi-Fi, right? Wi-Fi during uh, the pandemic is never consistent. So thank you for that. Um, so, so my question, I'll just repeat it, is um, what do we make of this statement that we should not necessarily be placing you know, the sole blame on France, but, but really on understanding what is driving these terrorist attacks. I really open it up to to anyone. Benjamin, I see you've unmuted yourself, so please. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I wanted to, to, to say something about that. Um, I really loved when I when I saw that article popping up uh, in the New York Times because to me it's it's a very it was a very strange reminder of how the French press and basically like the international press uh, talks about attacks in Israel. And the fact uh, that the New York Times said that there was a police shooting, that the police sh shot somebody after uh, a knife attack, in, like the fact that, it, that this was quoted to above, like in France regarding one attack in France, really made me laugh. I was like, wow, that's, 
that's 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 why now that uh, the same reaction is happening in France instead of happening in Israel. I mean, I, I, do you do you, I don't know if I I don't know if I'm clear, but basically we see those kind of reactions uh, on situations that are happening in Israel when there is a terror a terror attack on Israeli civilians, and so the fact that we saw this reaction from U.S. newspapers on uh, an action that took place in France was uh, was very strange to me, and I and I really like at that time I was like okay like. I think there is a misunderstanding in in uh, in what has happened, really, because there was a beheading of a uh, history teacher who was talking, who who showed a drawing uh, to his students, and so the fact that you say police is shooting uh, the police is shooting a man after an, a knife attack. Was like absolutely uh, astonishing to me. I mean, that was like completely out of out of uh, out of mind and out of uh, context. Um, so I know that the, the newspaper re-edited the the article a couple later later, but the screenshots remain, and you know it's um, it was uh, it was interesting. Uh, so yeah, yeah Antoine. No, yeah, it was um, the the yeah the 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 shot remains, the title remains, and I must say I was shocked. Like I'm, I'm not easily shocked, but uh, I've been I, I I thought it was fake. Uh, yeah. I mean, a guy literally beheads someone in the street, then shoots at the police and gets killed, which I must say happens three or four times a year in France, it never happens. Uh, police never shoots anyone, almost never. Uh, there are very little violent crimes in France, approximately 300 a year countrywide. Uh, so an event like that uh, treated in the way it was, police shoots down man, he had a knife. What I thought it was a fake person. Wow. I mean, I think it's 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 really interesting for us to be able to um, to hear this perspective. I think um, you know your your analogy is, is really apt. Um, so thank you for that perspective. Um, I want to turn it over to Shani for our last few questions, which will be uh, for Marie Sarah, because um, you have a really interesting perspective, both as someone who works professionally within the Jewish community, but also as someone who is a member of you know, access Paris and is involved in this advocacy work. So Shani, I want to turn it to you for the for the last uh, official question we have from Marie Serra. And also, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A function in the chat. We will be uh, addressing those uh, momentarily. So Shani. Thank you, Dana, exactly. So Marie Serra, uh, maybe two quick questions for you, if you have the, if we have the time for that. So. What has been the role of social media in these recent attacks? Um, and maybe a last question on, uh, would be, how is the Jewish community organized and how does it interact uh, with public policies? Um, and what can the young Jewish leaders like yourself can do at their level, according to you? Okay, I'll try to be uh, to be quick because I so you all have a lot of questions and we're happy to uh, to have a real conversation with you all. So about the social media, uh, first of all, I think it's important to underline the huge the huge responsibility of uh, social networks, whether uh, it's positive or negative. In France, a big social network uh, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube uh, are protected by the law of 1881, known as the press law. Uh, and today, there is a real impunity regarding social networks and the content published over there. A few months ago, um, you maybe you know about this, uh, the French National uh, Assembly passed a law, the AVIA law, in favor of uh, penalizing social networks and internet platforms if they did not remove uh, hate content within 24 hours. This law is uh, inspired by the, the German law and it was extremely controversial since it was rejected by a large part of the deputies, 
and then it was questioned by the Senate, which is the second French um, parliamentary chamber. So in my opinion, we have a problem in France with regard to our understanding of social networks and, re and their responsibility. We do not take them seriously enough. Unfortunately, what happened to Samuel Paty could have happened a long time before, and it will probably happen again if we continue to ignore highly dangerous content. Um, Samuel Paty, as you know, has been the target of threats and insults online. Parents of students um, launched fatwas against him on social networks, and all of this was visible. It was reported. It was reported to the government monitoring platform called Pharos, and however, it has neither been moderated nor investigated. And here we are today wondering how this happened. <laughs> Let me tell you one thing, the social media platforms are full of racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and so on. So we all know that, the government knows that, and the social media platforms know that. They actually perfectly know it because institutions, associations are working every day in order to, to report hate content and delete them to make internet better and safer. Um, very recently, it was uh, during the summer, uh, due to a common effort with many Jewish institutions such as AJC and CRIF, Facebook deleted uh, the page of the anti-Semitic uh, polemist Dieudonné, and uh, YouTube deleted also uh, his account. But until now, the main issue is still around Twitter. Um, I noticed that Facebook and Google are moving in a good direction. Twitter in the opposite is not doing enough by letting obvious hate content online being there. They just don't delete them. Um, and this is especially true uh, since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened. Um, so this, this was about the social media uh, issues. Um, then, Chani, you asked me about the Jewish community and how it is organized. Um, in France, so I'll try to be short. There are three main French Jewish organizations. Uh, we have CRIF, so the Representative Council for, of the French Jewish Institutions. Uh, CRIF represents more than 70 Jewish associations. Its main role is to be the link between the French Jewish community and the French public policy. So it, it has a political role. Then you have the Consistoire, which is the religious uh, institution in charge of the kosher, the synagogues, and the religious ceremonies, and so on. And finally, you have the Fonds Social Juif Unifié, which is a social fund dedicated to the social and educational issues for those in need. So that can be our children, um, elderly people, Holocaust survivors. Those three organizations work or try to work as, as much as possible uh, together to be more efficient. Um, I think especially during COVID, we, we all learned to work better together um, we, to set up campaigns and action to help as many people um, as possible. You have also, of course, a lot of associations in France, such, like, um, such as uh, AJC Paris, of course, all the students' associations. We really have the chance to have a very well organized community in France. I don't know how uh, my friends here feel, but for me, I feel solidarity. I feel friendship uh, in the Jewish community, and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty good, actually, to feel that. Uh, and about how to get involved, well, I can only say uh, do it, get involved um, for the Jewish community, of course, but also for any cause you feel close to. Um, I think it's, it's important to be uh, a committed individual today, maybe more than ever. Uh, so in France, you can join several associations or groups, um, AJC Access, uh, some student networks, you can take Hebrew lessons or join a Zionist uh, movement. Uh, you can also be an anti-Semitism fighter on the social media. Uh, yes, it is still useful. You can do it. You can report hate content, you can raise awareness around you educate people as much as you can about Israel and the history of the Jewish people. Um, as Shani mentioned it before, I, I'm the digital communication manager at CRIF, and this is my way to be involved. Um, after a few years spent in Israel, it was important for to me to uh, stay around. And um, I'm, I'm very proud to be an active part of the French Jewish community. Um, for the story, I, I remember when, when I was in high school, 
I ran for a student election in my town municipality. It was for um, the municipality council. Young people could get involved. And uh, to be elected, I, I had to present some, you know, things that we do in my high school. And the first one was fight anti-Semitism. And I was in high school in, in a town in France where you have 5,000 people. So there was no anti-Semitism because they were just my family as Jewish people. So um, but it was already my, uh, <laughs> my my main point in life. So um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it now for maybe both. Thank you very much, Marisa. Thank you for this amazing answer. So, Dana, maybe let's... Uh, yes. We have so many questions. We have so many questions, so many great questions. Um, there are a few that are similar to each other. Can you hear me okay? Is that my... Okay, wonderful. Um, there are some questions that are similar to each other, so I'm going to try and um, piece them together um, and obviously um, I think these questions are open to everyone. So the first question comes from quite a few people, uh, which talks about the numbers of uh, young people specifically who made Aliyah to Israel um, in the uh, early mid 2000s. Um, but as we know, those numbers are actually dropping of the numbers of people who are uh, choosing to leave France for Israel. Um, Marisa, you mentioned that you made Aliyah, but you are currently back in Paris. And, and I remember, Benjamin, at the 2019 Global Forum, when you were on a panel, you shared that um, there is a real effort on behalf of young uh, French Jews to stay in, in France and to really support the community there. So we would love to hear your perspectives. Maybe, um, Marisa, you can tell us a little bit about what encouraged you to make Aliyah, but also uh, what encouraged you to come back. Um, and then also we'd love to hear, um, you know, Antoine and Benjamin, if you have other perspectives on this question. Uh, sure, so I didn't make Aliyah. I spent few years in Israel, but didn't make okay. Aliyah. Um, but I, I spent, yeah, um, almost four years um, over there. And um, I'm pretty sure I will, I will go back, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but I also love to be in France, really. Um, I, I love France. It's an amazing country. And I realized that also because I lived elsewhere. I think it's the case for everyone who has this uh, experience. Um, so I think now people who make Aliyah, it's mainly because of security issues. It's that I'm... I think it's the case. In France, people are pretty attached to Zionism, to Israel, of course. But um, maybe there is a misinformation about what's going on over there, uh, because it's not enough to be Jewish to be just an Israeli. <laughs> like you, you need to have a project, something, I don't know, um, a job. <laughs> um, so I, I, as you say, like I'm, I'm working or uh, in, in order to reach people stay in France, because uh, as many politician leader uh, said before, uh, France without the Jews is not France anymore. So <laughs> you can stay in France. There is a, there is room for you. Amazing. Thank you, um, Antoine. Yeah, there's um, just a little thing I'd like to add on that. Um, there's actually been. Now, Prime Minister de, de, Edouard Philippe, uh, I think it was last year, uh, <coughs> talked about an internal alia from French Jews, uh, the fact that several, well, tens of thousands of Jews uh, had to leave the places they lived in in France uh, because they were harassed, because they didn't feel safe anymore. Uh, but most of them chose to move elsewhere in France, uh, which also means that there are relative, relatively safe spaces. Uh, I live in Paris, uh, in Western Paris, and I don't feel unsafe at all uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there are places where, in France, where we can live uh, a happy and normal life uh, with all the things I've. Uh, I've mentioned before, of course, but uh, there's no 
in my uh, in my opinion, in my sense, uh, the way I see things, there's no general uh, willingness uh, to leave once and for all. Mm, that's really helpful, um, Benjamin. Um, so since I've been ba I've been back from the U.S. Uh, when I arrived, I was uh, very surprised. I was expecting to be, um, you know, to have this anti-Semitism I used to face when I was younger. Um, I had followed the the all the events that took place uh, in 2015 and 2016 uh, from the U.S. And when I got back in, at the end of 2018. Um, I was very surprised actually by the flourishing and thriving Jewish life that we have in Paris. Um, there are like many events that are organized. There are like a Jew, like a, an active uh, Jewish life in the synagogues. And also there are two Moshe, house, Moshe houses that I discovered the concept when I was in the US. And I, I was, I, did, I had no idea that there was Moshe houses in Paris. So there is a life, there is a, an active Jew, Jewish life in Paris. Um, Regarding the, the, the numbers of Jews that are leaving to Israel, uh, my brother actually made Aliyah. Uh, for instance, he just made Aliyah a year, a year uh, exactly a year ago. Um, so it's, I guess it depends. It's like um, it was a strong Zionism uh, spirit that he had and that he wanted to to be over there. So it's, uh, I, I guess it depends on, on on the reasons. But yes, I think the fact that. The Jews were not only the tar well, yeah, not only the target of terrorist attacks made kind of a, a change in uh, the will of the Jews to stay in France. Uh, the fact that they were not only targeted but like as a general target, like the French people as a general target, maybe that that triggers the 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 the, the fact to stay to stay over here. Thank you. I think these are really interesting perspectives and really helpful for us as we understand the reality, but also uh, different trends that have happened in France over the last few years for the Jewish community. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. So my last question that I have is, as you know, in AJC, we do a lot of work with our intergroup and interreligious partners. Um, and that has been a, a really significant value for us here in the States. Um, there have been a couple questions about what do intergroup or interreligious partnerships look like in France um, between the Jewish community and, and others um, outside of the Jewish community. This can be open to anyone. Um. I, I can say some things uh, that maybe for I'm a professional person, but um, I think there are groups that work in interfaith in uh, inter-religious uh, um, uh, uh, dialogue, actually. Um, I know the Jewish community is very close to the Christian community, for sure. Like, we have a strong um, relationship and talk a lot about relig religion in the first place. Um, then with the Muslim community, it's also a big thing. I know um, there is an, a student association in France uh, called UEGF, and they, they do, they do um, a lot of work with the, um, with the young um, Muslims uh, in France and um, elsewhere. Actually, they, they do some um, trips in Israel to Abgosh or the cities where you can have a, a mixed uh, population. And uh, so I think we do, but we maybe we obviously don't do enough. Uh, and everyone needs to learn from the other, of course. Um, we do that all the time. Uh, but I know maybe in the US, actually, you hear that uh, the Jews and the Muslim are not talking. It's like a cold war or something. It, it's not true. Um, it's, it's very cliche, but we all have Muslim friends. We all have friends from other um, uh, religion and I mean it's not even an issue like I don't I don't count my Muslim friends like I don't even know if they're Muslim or just Arabic or I don't even care um, you know you go to school to parties to universities you travel so it, it's really it's really not an issue and I think the more more and more we talk 
and we educate everyone. Uh, we learn from other religion and history and countries. And I mean, I, I, I don't see it as an issue in France, really. So uh, I hope it's not too much like this in the media or in the social media elsewhere in the world. I, I know it's sometimes the case, but um, I, I don't. I think it's yeah. we all uh, we all people. I mean, it's pretty I'm cliche. But I'd like to. Yeah. I'd like to tell about you know coexisting. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this uh, this organization, and uh, it's an organization that basically enables the dialogue between Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, and many religions. And I think uh, that's a, that's a great initiative that started in the like I don't know maybe five ten five ten years ago, uh, and uh, and it's it's really strong. It goes into schools to educate about Judaism, in, uh, about about Islam, about Christianism, and it just asks people, okay, what can you tell me what is Judaism? Can you tell me what is Islam? Can you tell me what is uh, Catholicism? And then and the debate starts, and I think that exactly as Marissa was saying, like the more we educate people and the more we talk to each other about our differences and the more we'll learn from each other, the better we, the better we will be. Yeah, uh, I'd like to add a little something. Uh, to what uh, my colleagues just said, and especially my um, I've never, I don't really know about those initiatives because I, I had until, I had never felt the need uh, to know about them until recently, because as my said, I have friends and they're friends, and some of them are Muslim, some of them are Jewish, some of them are Christian, some of them don't have a religion. And it's rather new uh, to me that society has it's being this uh, segmented uh, into uh, uh, these notions of identity. And that's uh, going back to a, an earlier question that I think we, we may be uh, passed through a little bit, uh, a little uh, quickly. Um, I think that's what caused my very large sense of loneliness and incomprehension on the way uh, the situation was portrayed in the US uh, and in the New York Times, uh, the Post, uh, newspapers that I hold as references, uh, because I've heard and read many, many false statements about uh, the way Muslim people were treated uh, here in France, uh, which, well, I've studied with Muslim people, I work with Muslim people every single day. Um, I'm not saying there aren't any issues, but clearly, uh, France doesn't have an issue with Muslims, but the fight we're the fight we are confronted with is with basically ISIS supporters, uh, people who are ready to kill uh, for because they feel offended. Uh, but n if I have one last word, uh, is that uh, our existence as Jews is an offense to these people. Uh, so if if we bow down, if we don't stand up for the values that have made us free, uh, we know how this ends. Wow. Well, thank you so much for um, for that really thoughtful perspective. I think you know one of the well, things that we hold. <laughs> no, it was very thoughtful. I think you know our our work in AJC is obviously rooted in global Jewish advocacy, and to be able to hear in such detail um, from our access leaders in Paris about their experiences are just so remarkable. So we're so grateful for each of you for sharing your story and for sharing about the advocacy that you are doing in Paris and on behalf of AJC um, across the world. It's really remarkable. Um, we are actually out of time, which is, which is so sad for us, but we are so um, happy that we were able to have this conversation and we hope we'll be able to have many more in the future. So uh, on behalf of all of us at Access and, and AJC, we wanna thank you, uh, uh, merci for this conversation. And um, we hope that you will be able to join us for all of our participants. Thank you for joining us for this call today. We hope you'll be able to join us for future remote access programs. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about AJC programs and our Advocacy Anywhere programs, you can visit our website, agency.org backslash Advocacy Anywhere. Shani, any closing thoughts? 
I can just echo what you just said. Thank you very much to the three of you. And thank you for everybody who has been watching the, this webinar and asking questions. It was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, merci, be well. And uh, we look forward to hopefully having another conversation in the near future. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.